Hey there everybody, Joe here. Thanks for tuning in again. So this footage on this video is, is me doing a rendering for a mural that I'm going to paint. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about my method of preparing to do a mural. I always do renderings. Now, I didn't always do that before. So you see me working with primaries. I just set the camera up on the table and, and then so that you can see the paint in my painting. And I work from the primaries because that helps me to determine uh, what, what my favorite colors are in the scheme. Where if I pre-mix, if I try to get real calculated and, and make the exact colors I want to use for the picture, there's fewer things for me to see and visualize because they, you know, it's more of a limited color palette. So I like to work from the primaries. And I think that if you practice that method, you'll find that it's very liberating to have fewer colors and throw together a, a rendering based on always, always the same colors. Uh, there's something about it that really lends itself well to the a creative process. So I'm just encouraging you to experiment with that. It's not easy for everybody to mix right from primaries, but I do think that it, you get more fluent over time practicing that. The reason that I am so big on doing these renderings now is because, I mean, too many times have I just relied on my ability to make a nice mural and forgotten that it, there's another thing that's needed. It needs to be what the customer actually wants. And so it doesn't matter how well it's done, if it's not what they're dreaming of, then that problem is, is easily solved by going through the trial and error process on a small scale. And it gives me a very good idea of the amount of work it's going to take to do the large version if I do the smaller version. So even if, you know, you're just doing a little picture this big, you know, even that is really helpful because of the, it helps you wrap your mind around the complexity that you're dealing with. Bigger details usually just means a bigger brush. And so it's not necessarily a, a scale that exactly matches the size change. You know, if you're trying to figure out how long it's going to take you to paint a big picture, that's a common question is how uh, do you price murals? Well, so this, I, I don't know if I've, I've ever talked about this very much in a video. I price murals uh, with one flat price. I don't do things by the hour because that just gets too awkward for someone to wonder whether or not I'm taking advantage of the time and just trying to burn up the clock, making it longer than it needs to be, making the price higher than it needs to be. I don't want to deal with that. They don't want to deal with that. We need a set agreement so that we know that it's honest. I never plan on finishing early because that's the same issue. That creates feelings of, of uh, did you race through this? You know, there was, you, you had budgeted for this amount of time, you finished a day early, and so now the customer has this product that you did and you're saying it's finished, but that leaves them with the feeling of, oh, well, you raced to get done early and I got less quality. So that might not be true, but it will always feel like that to a client. So it's important that I always plan on filling up the time. If I plan ahead, I'm going to work the whole five days that I budgeted this for. And then there's, there's never a question. And I know that I always want to fill up that extra time anyway, because I want it to be as good as I can possibly make it. So I go through the rendering process and it allows me to troubleshoot you know, issues with the client. So the next question is, yeah, but what about the time it takes to do that? You got to get paid for your time. Yes, that's true. You always choose the amount of risk that you want. If you're confident in your ability to reach an agreement with your customer, which I am, then sometimes I'll just include that consideration in the total estimate for the job. So that when I'm doing the rendering, I know I'm I know that I have proposed enough of a price on the total job that this is covered. Uh, but if you feel like you're going to go back and forth a million times, then you may choose, and it's your choice. You may choose to say, "I'll do a rendering. This is how much it'll cost per rendering." And so in that case, you, you might have a customer that is wondering if if you're just again, taking advantage of their 
budget saying I'm just going to pump out these weak renderings and get paid for the time. There's always going to be those questions of doubt. So as a professional, you want to eliminate as much of that question as possible. So you always choose. And the way you communicate with somebody makes a huge difference in that. You have to really let somebody know. Now, I know I said I was talking about pricing, but this all has to do with it. You really want to let a customer know that you're listening to what they want and you're considering it so that they know that in the next rendering what they've communicated is going to be represented and then you can eliminate a lot of that awkward frustration that happens between an artist and a client as you're trying to to produce something that's what they want in the end it really is your choice whether or not you choose to charge per per sketch or whether you, whether you choose not to. The, I don't think there's like an industry standard for that. Same with pricing. I don't think there's an industry, sta industry standard for pricing. I am always less than someone else, more than somebody else. And that's okay. The important thing with pricing is that you are confident and your mind is fixed on it when you present it because it doesn't look good. When somebody asks you how much and you say I'll paint a picture on your wall for five hundred dollars uh, but I mean if that's a lot for you then I could go a little bit less I mean uh, how do you feel about it? Is that a good price? You know, that's not fun for a customer when you do that kind of stuff it's good just to be willing to lose the job okay it's not it's not morally offensive when you're expensive I didn't mean for that to rhyme it sounded like a, a little rhymey quote not morally offensive when you're expensive. And it's better just to say, I would charge $1,500 to do that. Look them square in the eye, politely, and say it with confidence, and give them the freedom to say no. And if they say, no, we don't want to do that, then, then you don't come back and say, well, how about if it's less? How about if I do it for 1000 <laughs> I mean, you can do that, but it's... I just don't feel like it's good for my reputation if I do that kind of thing. You have to be willing to lose customers. That's how you find the right price. It's completely relative to what people will pay or what they won't pay. There's, that's, that's what it is. It's supply and demand. Uh, people will pay this for, for your work or they won't. And you find that by just trying things out. Saying no to a job or or um, being willing to, to hear no, rather, You're, it's too expensive, is very important. Being willing to lose jobs is, is so much less stress on you as an artist because other opportunities come along. And if that is your only opportunity, then, then it wasn't meant to be anyway. You want to save room for the better opportunities that come along. And I think that as an artist, we tend to compare ourselves to what's over here in that town and what people are doing there instead of just feeling out the market that that you're in and and just charging what you need to make for your time I can't tell you what that is nobody can and nobody will because it's it's up to you it's your job to decide it and if nobody is biting on those prices then you either lower them or live without work that's it's just a very simple rule and so my, my main point in all of this is that you have to be confident about what you're trying out and be willing to lose the job so that you can be professional and respectable in the eyes of clients so that when you do get a job, it feels really honest and you leave yourself room to do it right. Number of edges. This came up a couple videos ago. So detail is in the number of edges. And that represents the amount of detail. I, I don't physically, or, or I don't, you know, uh, literally count every single edge that's in a picture. But I can recognize the number, uh, I, I can base it on my past experience. Say this is a picture that has a lot of edges in it. An edge can be a soft blended change from this color to that color, or it can be a hard edge. You know, both of them take time to accomplish. But it's good to recognize how many different shapes am I going to paint in this picture. That's a good way to gauge your, uh, how complex your picture is. 
But you'll figure that out just by doing the small painting. I always do that. So I'm looking at comments from last week's video. Lacey, I don't know, Lackey, Lacey, I think he's Gail Lacey. Wow, Joe, uh, you really are a wonderful, talented teacher. Thank you very much. It always makes me feel a little bit weird when I read compliments to myself on video. But uh, nevertheless, thank you, that's very nice. I especially enjoyed seeing how you fixed the eyes, taught me a lot. Isn't that interesting how seeing somebody uh, do something wrong or imp imperfect and ha having to fix it tends to be the more valuable demonstration than uh, s seeing it go right. You know, it is important for us to see the right way to do something, but then to see how to curve it and, and correct it when it doesn't come out completely right. That's really helpful for me. So I, I made a decision uh, a while back that I was going to start including more of, of those takes in my videos that showed when things didn't come out right because I realized that that's valuable information as to how to, how to get it on, on track. You know, if you imagine taking off on a bicycle, especially when you're first learning, and you know, it's wobbly because you're going slow. You need the speed to straighten it out. So you, it's really hard to just have it perfectly balanced right from the beginning. You get it moving first, and then you straighten it out as you're going. So sometimes you just gotta get paint on the wall, get your drawing made so that you have something to look at and understand how to curve it to where you want it to go. That's, that's how I approach all my art. And, and so thank you for appreciating that. I'm glad that you like that because because that is a conscious decision to make sure I include those things rather than do retakes and try to only show my best attempts. <laughs> Ray Shannon, so I'm just going to read part of this. Uh, thank you, Ray Shannon, for this nice comment uh, saying, Answers I've needed for a long time. Faces have been a mystery and not worth wrecking my self-esteem, but you present the instructions like a puzzle and made it easy to understand. Thank you very much for pointing that out. I, I appreciate that encouragement. I know that I'm, I'm similar in that way. I really really need clear instruction and I, I get real real lost if there's too much information uh, especially like sub information okay I need the priorities like this is the big picture you have to do this then this then this and so if something goes into great detail about each step right from the beginning I get confused and so yeah there are a lot of little nuances that I'm doing in between all of those steps that was in that drawing but the important thing are are the things I explained because I know that you the artist will develop your own questions that are in between those you know you you read in between the lines and say but what about this what about in this situation but but developing the questions is more important than having an explanation that answers all of them right from the beginning because if if it's my question then I'm going to remember the answer. But if it wasn't my question to begin with, I ne if I never had the opportunity to develop the question, then it's harder for me to remember the answer because it's less relevant. I don't have a place to file that. You know, I imagine a, an answer to a question like a full of paper you put in a file cabinet. If, if you have the question, the answer is a paper you put inside that folder. But if you don't have the question, you're like, oh, what do I do with this? I'll just put it here. I'll find it later. You know, and, and it's not organized. You don't go right to it. That's, that's my best analogy for that. Anyway, uh, thank you, Ray Shannon, for pointing that out. John Snyder uh, looks like a fellow Ohioan. Joe, you grew up in Marion, Ohio. That is awesome. I'm from Columbus, just down the road. Thanks for all the great instruction. I hope you get to visit Ohio again soon. I hope I get to visit Ohio again soon. And that reminds me uh, that I missed a good friend's comment uh, two videos ago that that long philosophical conversation between me and Ben. Chris Myers, an old friend from our church back in Ohio. I have a funny memory with, with Chris. You know, his, his dad, Keith, we loved to punch him in the stomach. Real big guy, and when we were kids, he was just our hero. We just loved to beat on that guy because he was just so big. Chris says, nice conversation between Ben and you. I remember those crazy days on Sefner. That was the old street I lived on. All you guys are very talented. See, I have four brothers, and so all five of us were very artistically inclined, and just the creativity manifested in different ways with each brother. So we were always doing, doing stuff, and when someone would come over to our house, 
they would be, they would have the onslaught of five kids saying, look, look what I did, look at it. We all love to show off our stuff. So any old friends from Ohio remember that environment uh, of us always looking for something new to make and be creative. Chris, I'm sure, uh, remembers the good times we had in making potato guns. If you ever made a potato cannon, you know, PVC, you stuff potatoes in there and use Aquanet hairspray as the best explosive, just in case you wanted. You gotta use Aquanet hairspray to launch a potato. You hit an igniter and a boom, shoots a potato like football field distance. We were always trying to create stuff like that. And Chris was part of those good memories. He says he's uh, still working with graphite. Well, yes, obviously now since I'm talking about my pencil drawing video. Thanks for watching, Chris. Miss you. And uh, it's real exciting to see old friends back from where I grew up. Amon Olsen, thank you for commenting, says, uh, I've never seen this method. Very cool. Proko, has, I don't know who Proko is, but you give it a visit, see, see what that is. Proko has a lot of tutorials on portraits you should check out. If you get a chance, let's, let's see what uh, Proko has. I always appreciate other methods. I ate my homework, says, portraits are always difficult. I agree. They are always difficult. And I always have to try hard when I'm doing it. It never comes easy. And so, you know, I never want to mislead anybody into thinking that it's just an easy thing. All right, I'll stop there with the comments and look forward to seeing what you have to say next week. I want to let you know that we're looking to give away this drawing. It's, I got it laying over here on the counter. Let me grab this. We're trying to get more patrons uh, to help with the funding for uh, all of the free content that's on YouTube. So this is part of my new how to draw faces video, this this uh, page of portraits. I just pulled these these pictures off of Google and drew four famous people that make me laugh. And so I have this drawing and I have this drawing of John Wick that, that was uh, last week's video. We want to give this away. And so you can choose if you win this drawing, choose which one and I'll mail it to you. Here's how you win is sign up on Patreon. So if you choose to pledge uh, at least one dollar per month. That's the minimum amount and I'm super thrilled if you choose that minimum amount in two weeks I'm not going to do it on next week's video But in two weeks we'll do a random drawing from all of the people who have pledged on patreon So a patron you're you're a patron if you uh, do that I have a monthly video feed that is just for the patrons also I recently posted a how to paint a, a beach wave on canvas painting for all of the patrons and so I'll continue to post videos that are that are uh, just a reward for those who choose to pledge but I want to let you know about that drawing I'll be excited to mail this to somebody and the winner uh, will just need to send me uh, some some address to put this drawing in the mail so uh, I hope you get a chance to enter that and that'll be fun for us to do a giveaway I guess that's all I have to say for now so <laughs> thanks for tuning in and I'll see you again next time.